We're going to take a look uh, the next four weeks uh, at this scene from different vantage points, from different views, from different uh, people. And this week, we begin with someone who just happens to be at the right place at the wrong time. His name was Simon. He was the father of two sons, Alexander and Rufus. Uh, seemed like he had a good family, a great wife. They were uh, from a coastal city called Cyrene or Serene, depending on how you pronounce it. It's located in North Africa, what would today be modern-day uh, Libya. Cyrene was a modern city of its time. It was flourishing cultural center of the Greeks, and then the Romans uh, took over, and uh, it remained such. Uh, for the most part, Rome kind of left them alone because it was closely aligned to their own values and mores. The city happened to be home to over 100,000 Jews who were very passionate about their service of God, so much so that they had their own synagogue in Jerusalem which was very, very rare. Now, Simon and his family, we don't know, but chances are they probably had saved for a very long time to make this journey to Jerusalem. You see, the Jewish people were commanded uh, early in the scriptures every year to make this pilgrimage from wherever they were uh, to Israel to celebrate uh, a couple of festivals. The first, the one that he's here for at, at this point, is the seven-day celebration of the Passover. The second is the Festival of Feasts, which happens uh, 50 days later. Thus, it's also known as Pentecost. Jerusalem was packed to the gills with people. Uh, a city of maybe a couple hundred thousand could swell to well over a million during this time. It seems that uh, Simon and his family, either because it was too crowded or because of economic means, decided, like many people, to camp and live outside of the city. And so he came in, like many, to celebrate the festival from out in the country, each of the seven days. And right in the middle of this celebration, he was not surprised that the Romans had chosen this day and time for a good old-fashioned crucifixion. It was something that they uh, did to kind of let everyone know, don't mess with Rome, but they particularly probably chose this time to let all the hundreds and thousands of Jews that were there behave yourself, or this could happen to you. It was a warning. It was a statement of their authority and of their intention. Now, Simon probably just kind of came across this. Probably wasn't thinking about watching, but I mean, you couldn't help but having a quick look. And when he did have a quick look, there was a couple things that stuck out to him. The first is the Romans had two different ways to deal with folks. The first was lashings, and they had worked it out where they could lash you right down to an inch of your life, but you wouldn't die. They had it down to a science. But really, it was a severe way of punishing someone with the intention that they were going to go on. The other way was crucifixion. Again, something that they had perfected. It was the longest, most drawn out, most miserable way a human being could die. They suffocated. Now, what was unusual that he observed was that one of the men that was being led down was a victim of both. Obviously, he wasn't going to last that long on uh, the cross of crucifixion because he had been beaten already to an inch of his life. And then even rarer still, he had wounds around his head. The other shocking thing, I'm sure, to Simon was the fact that the crowds were jeering and teasing this man. Now, the Jews didn't have love for lawbreakers any more than the Romans did, but they knew what this was about. This was a political statement. It wasn't about justice. It was a political statement, and usually the Jews kind of kept their mouths shut. 
They wouldn't give the Romans the satisfaction. They stood in solidarity. But in this case, amazingly, the Jews were teasing and jeering a fellow Jew. And he kind of shook his head in disbelief. Then the unthinkable happened. Because he had been beaten, because he was already so weak, he had stumbled right in front of Simon. It was obviously he could no longer carry the beam that he was supposed to carry to his own crucifixion. And so the Roman soldier looked around and he picked the Jew, the first one that he could find, and it was Simon. You are going to carry the beam. You are going to carry this for him. Now, this was part of Roman law. They can impose upon you to help. Jesus, remember, says if, if they impose upon you to carry for a mile, carry two. Because that was the law of the day. But it would have particular detrimental effects on Simon. Because you see, by touching the cross, by touching the, something that this man had bled on, he was now ceremonially unclean. And he would not be allowed to worship in the temple. But he had no choice. And so he picks up the cross and he begins to follow. And all along the way, he continues to hear this mixture of curses and praise. But it's interesting because the curses aren't, you stupid thief, you caused this. You did this wrong. They're actually teasing him, teasing him about saving himself, teasing him about being the king of the Jews. This is absolutely perplexing. Even more so perplexing was the praises. I mean, sometimes when a thief was on his way, you know, there were some folks from his crew, you know, who might say something, and, and maybe his family might cry. But along the way, Simon was hearing things like, no, I was blind, but now I can see because of him. I was crippled, but now I'm walking because of him. There's obviously people that weren't members of his family who loved him dearly, who were crying out and bawling. And then at one point, Jesus stops as a particular group of women are just weeping and their heart is broken and he takes the time to comfort them. This man beaten within an inch of his life on his way to a cross takes the time to comfort them. There's something unusual here. When he got to the hill that had been prepared for the crucifixion, I guess this Simon didn't leave. He had to see how the story played out. And the Romans did what they have routinely do. They took the cross beam and put it on top of a, of a straight beam. They nailed Jesus' hands to the cross beam. They nailed his feet to the straight beam. And they set it up. Like I said, the object is for the person to slowly suffocate from the weight of their own body. And to make sure that that they didn't have, you know, it didn't go out too long. and It wasn't too easy on them. They would put a nail in the wrists and a nail in the feet. Why? So they couldn't use the strength in their arms and legs to lift themselves. It would be too excruciating. He watched as the soldiers divided up the, the clothes and cast lots for it. And he watched as not only the crowds came and jeered, even the religious leaders their spiritual leaders who usually kind of contain themselves were giddy. Those of you who watched the political process this last year know what I'm talking about. Adolescence, pure hatred. And that's what he saw. But then he also observed those who would come and just beg boldly. They themselves could be punished or beaten or whatnot, but boldly proclaim, let this man down. This is unfair. And then <laughs> they nailed the charges like they often do. And the person on his right and the person on his left, they nailed up these signs that they were thieves, that they were robbers. 
They deserve this punishment. But above this man, who they were calling Yeshua, just like Yeshua, Joshua, who led the Israelites into the promised land, above him, they put a sign, King of the Jews? What does that even mean? If nothing else, it's a claim of someone who's insane, not a, something you crucify somebody for. This Yeshua, this Jesus, didn't say much on the cross. He saved his breath, it seemed, for things that needed to be communicated often to God in heaven. But finally, he cried out and died. And for Simon, there was just more questions than there were answers. And that is the end of the historical account of Simon from Cyrene. Or is it? What we know of Simon is actually very, very narrow, very, very small. He's mentioned in a verse in three different of the Gospels. Mark 15, 21, which we've already heard. Matthew 27, 32. Luke 23, 26. All mention that Simon was the one who carried the cross. The longest, though, of the three is the one in Mark. Where he says uniquely that he was the father of Alexander and Rufus. Now stop and think about that. There's many, many details in the Bible about different people. There was leopards who came to get healed. There, there was certain people, a centurion who came, and they're just kind of generally mentioned. But here we have three distinct and unique names. And it wasn't like he was a governor or pilot or Caesar. This is just a random person along the road. Why do we know their names? Most likely because the people who Mark was writing to knew these people. Oh, it's Simon that he's talking about. Oh, it's Alexander and Rufus's dad he's talking about. We know them. Most likely somewhere along the way, they became believers and known to the early church. Another interesting thing is after Christ's death and resurrection. Many people see him and he tells his disciples to wait for this Pentecost. And the Holy Spirit comes upon them. And in Acts chapter 2, we have this picture where their spirits are revived. The Holy Spirit now resides in them. And they go out, remember, from the upper room and they, they begin to talk to the crowds. And everyone's hearing their own native language. And in Acts chapter 2, verse 10, it actually says that among this crowd are some that are from Cyrene. You know that story ends, right? Peter preaches, this Jesus whom you crucified, he's talking to the Jewish people there, has risen from the dead, and 2,000 people come to follow Jesus. Later on, in Acts chapter 11, Right, right before this, uh, uh, people begin to proclaim Jesus, and, and one in particular, uh, Stephen, goes out and, and he's talking about Jesus. And the religious leaders don't like this idea, and they decide to throw stones at him. And one of the reasons this sticks out is because this is where Saul, who would become Paul, he holds their coats while they all pick up a rock and they stone Stephen to death. And right after that happens, the, the Acts says that a great persecution breaks out. And then in chapter 11, it says this, starting in verse 20, it says, Some of them, some of them that were in Jerusalem that had to leave because of the persecution. However, men from Cyprus and Cyrene, who happened to be in Jerusalem, went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also. Remember what I, I said that Cyrene... It was a central place for Greek culture. They knew the Greek language. Telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. You see, some of these 
early Christians in Acts chapter 2 hung around with the church until Acts chapter 10. And when they were chased away, some of them, rather than going home, some of them went up to Antioch. And they shared the gospel. Now, for some of you, Antioch might kind of stick out in your mind. Because what happened is many of these people did come to Christ, but there was no one there to disciple them, to fully engage them. And so the disciples of the the 12, the apostles, heard about this in Jerusalem. Oh my goodness, there's Jewish Christians in Antioch. What are we to do? I know. Let's send Barnabas. He's a great man of encouraging. He'll disciple them. Barnabas goes up and goes, yes, the need is great here. He goes and gets Paul. Comes back and Barnabas and Paul disciple this church. And then later on, right? It's the church in Antioch as they're praying and they're worshiping God that the Holy Spirit says, set these two men apart, Paul and Barnabas. I want them to go tell more. And that's the first missionary journey. And then Paul and Silas from Antioch two more missionary journeys. And the gospel of Jesus Christ has spread more and more throughout the Roman Empire because of this. One last thing. Paul, he's yet to be to Rome. He hasn't gotten there yet, but he wants to get there. And so he writes a letter to the church in Rome to introduce himself, to introduce what he's really teaching. But at the end of the letter, some folks that he met in other places happen to find themselves in Rome. And so he says, hey, greet these people. And in Romans chapter 16, verse 13, it says this, greet Rufus, chosen the Lord and his mother who has been a mother to me too. Well, we don't know for sure, but most folks believe this Rufus is the same Rufus of Alexander and Rufus, Simon's sons. You see, in all likelihood, Simon of Serene experienced on that road to Calvary a conversion, a belief. If not then, absolutely after the resurrection. And his conversion led to the conversion of his family, specifically Alexander and Rufus. And later on, their experience affected their community And many from their community were converted and began to follow Jesus. And then those from the community ended up in Antioch. And they began to follow Jesus. And then Antioch sends out Paul and Barnabas. Well, and now you know the rest of the story. All that stemmed from one man being at the right place at the wrong time. You see, Simon's vantage point is, in one hand, unique, but in another way, it should be something that a lot of us can connect with. You see, Simon didn't get to hear the teaching. There was no Sermon on the Mount. There was no, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. He didn't get to see any of the miracles. He didn't get to see the blind man see or the lame walk. People cured from leprosy or Lazarus risen from the dead. He did get to see the darkness come over the land, but I'm sure that they could explain that. What he got to see was suffering up close and personal. What he got to see is that in the midst of the suffering, Jesus who on the outside looked like these things were happening to him had the kind of strength as if He chose this road. He got to see love. Though this this man seemed to be wrongly charged, ridiculously charged, unfairly charged, he still chose to minister to the women on the road, to his mother at the cross. He even cried out, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. He saw Jesus' love. And I think for many of us, um, maybe there's not these huge, the waters parting 
I was blind, but I see miracles. Some of us have those stories, but some of us don't. At least not initially. We didn't get to actually hear Jesus teaching. Yeah, you get to hear the pastor teaching, but there's this kind of question of is, you know, how much of this is him and how much of this really is him? I understand that. Life is hard. It's a struggle. We get to see the ugliness. We don't get to see everything kind of coming together and you know what those folks kind of say, if you just do all this right, it all comes together for you. you you'll, you'll be so successful. You'll be so great. And some of us, that's not our experience. But somewhere along the line, God opened up our eyes to his love. God opened up our eyes. And as it says in, the, in John's uh, letter, in 1 John, not the Gospel of John, but his, his epistle, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, it says this, This is love, not that you love God. Love really can't be measured by what us human beings do. It's so much more than that. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is love. And it's that simple act somewhere along the lines where our eyes were opened up, where we realized that Jesus suffered the innocent laid his life down, the great exchange to make atonement, to make amends between us and God, to pay a price that we could not pay for a God that initially we did not love. And it's that love, it's that act of love, as gruesome as it is, as, as, as much as I want to turn my head and not look at it, not think about it, it's that act of love that can transform a life. It can transform a family and a community and a world. And that is what we celebrate. And the result of that is an eternity, a relational eternity, not a, uh, you did so good. There's some good we do, but the good was really done by God. But it is eternity with our God where we can look our Savior in the eyes deep in the eyes, a long gaze, and we don't have to turn away. There is no shame because he atoned for in all the places that we lack. And that is what the season is all about. Amen? Amen. Father God, thank you for that kind of love, Dad. Thank you that when we were enemies, when we were at our worst, you were at your best. Thank you that though Jesus, who felt all the emotion, all the pain, that he did sweat blood, that he did say, hey man, is there another way? Thank you that when you said, this is the way, he said, your will be done. Thank you that it was love that took him to the cross. That it was love that kept him up there when he could have called down a legion of angels to rescue him. And I pray, dear God, that this love may permeate our hard hearts, our crusted souls, may transform us, that more and more our lives may be yours, like we sang, that more and more our lives may be laid down, that our lives may become a spiritual act of worship, as we seek your good, pleasing, and perfect will. Would you do work, that work in us in the same mighty way that you did this work for us? I pray this in the name of our Savior, Yeshua, our Lord Jesus, the God of God and King of Kings, our Messiah, who is the Christ. Amen and amen. God bless and may you walk in the dust of the Master.